Divine Truth Book Group. These are discussions of books selected by Jesus and Mary. This book group discusses Through the Mists by Afra and Robert James Lees. This is Chapter 18, The Family of Heaven. Hosts of this discussion are Mary and Jesus. The discussion was held on the 1st of May, 2014, in Wilsdale, Queensland, Australia. Hi, everyone. Today we're continuing our discussion of Through the Mists, and we're up to Chapter 18 this week. We're nearly through the book. Uh, this chapter is called The Family of Heaven, and I'm joined by Jesus, who's here to uh, talk through the various themes that we'll find in this book. Mm. So I hope you enjoy what we have to say. Mm, welcome. So, Dallin, you haven't reread this chapter recently, have you? No, I haven't. <laughs> no, yeah. yeah. This, in this chapter, um, if you remember, last week, we, uh, Frederick was with, he was coming um, on a journey with Arves to mm. see where Limpy Jack would live. Mm -hmm. And he spent some time in the home of the poetess and mm. they had a long discussion. And right at the end of the discussion, Mahanin came back. Uh, he came, well, he came to where they were. Mm. And so this chapter starts out where Myhanin is, has arrived. Yep. And, uh, and really the, there's a lot of really awesome themes, I think, in this chapter mm. surrounding the truth about families mm. and the truth about God's laws. Yes, particularly the truth about families. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of families on earth very, get very triggered about and uh, emotionally upset about what happens in the heavens about families. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, I think the way that it's... and So really the basis of this chapter is really discussion between Myhanine and Frederick. Mm, mm. And um, Myhanine says some wonderful things to, mm. to illustrate um, the truth and why it happens that way. Yeah. So let's get on into it, hey? Exactly. Yep. <laughs> um, right at the start of this chapter, uh, Frederick makes some remarks about Myhanin mm. and they're very beautiful. Uh, so right at the end of the last chapter, he was saying, um, he was saying that Myhanin's very presence reminded him uh, and the work that Myhanin does of this, um, something that's mentioned in the Bible that you did say, that he that would be greatest amongst you, the same shall be servant of all. Mm. And so Mahanin serves others mm -hmm. in this way. Mm -hmm. um, and then Fred goes on to say um, that he says that um, Mahanin's arrival and this living epistle of humility mm -hmm. um, it lingered in my mind. And then he thought of another thing that you had said, and that is that ye are the light of the world, a city that is set upon a hill cannot be hid. Mm -hmm which is actually a reference from Matthew chapter 5, 14. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought there were some interesting things that we could maybe talk about there in that paragraph mm. about... Yeah, I feel, I feel a lot of people, um, when it comes to their understanding of their own spiritual development, they don't understand that if they are the light of the world, th that it will be easily seen. Mm -hmm. And this is, I feel, what a lot of people who are listening to Divine Truth often get mixed up in. They, they either try to be the light of the world when their soul isn't the light of the world. In mm -hmm. fact, the soul contains a lot of darkness in it still. And so the soul's quite dark with regard to how it expresses itself in the world. But also there's the the feeling that many have of hiding the light that is in them at yeah. many times. So, so what they finish up doing is they become afraid of the light. They could become afraid of the truth. And we see a lot of people doing that as well, where they're so afraid of the truth that they, that they hold it all to themselves and keep it all to themselves. They don't express any of it. And the third way I feel that it also applies is that when you have received some of God's love, you become a happier person and it's evident yeah. and it shows. You become more secure, safe, so you, within yourself. You are, uh, it's easily, easily evident from someone looking at you yeah. that something's different about this person, something that's attractive too about this person. This person's like not only a walking example of humility, but also they have desire, they have passion, 
they have longings, they, they express themselves in the world, they're not afraid of the world, they express themselves in a manner that they're not afraid. And, it, and these are all the outward evidences that, that light exists inside the soul. Mm -hmm. And I feel for many people that doesn't exist. And so what they try to do is manufacture a light yes. rather than actually do what need, is necessary to be done to become the light yeah. that can shine upon the world. So a lot of the people who have come to our seminars have often said to us things like, we want to be leaders of a new world sort of revolution, if you like, about everyone learning how to love. And yet, quite often what we see is whenever there's an issue of love, they hide. Yeah. Or whenever there's an issue of truth, they hide. So you can't very well become a leader <laughs> in, in, a, in a revolution about love and truth when you're hiding the love and truth that's in you. And that's the thing, isn't it? It's about... <coughs> Um, the love and truth within you shining forth, not mm. necessarily words or deeds or any of these things. Correct. It's this thing that Mahanin displays through his very presence. Yes. And that is what we have the possibility of doing here on earth. And that that's probably the other thing that I feel about that paragraph there, that first paragraph, is that it's... Um, Frederick says about Mahanin right at the end of the paragraph, coming as the prophet of that life which lies before us, mm. like an advance guard to indicate what we shall be when we reach those heights. Mm. And for me, that made me think about the power of our own progression to serve as an inspiration to others, mm -hmm. and that we can do that while we're on earth. Mm -hmm. um, and, and how beautiful is it? I mean... Mm. Uh, well, it's very hard for people to progress, if you think about it, on a way that is sometimes quite difficult, particularly when you have to deal with emotion and you're quite resistive to emotions. Um, and so what most people do is they, they feel, you know, a lack of desire or they don't feel inspired. And it's only when there's somebody who's actually doing it in front of them yeah. that they start to feel inspired to do it themselves. And, and that, I feel, is because the person who's actually doing it in front of them, you, you can easily see they're doing something that's different. You yeah. can easily see that they're changing. You can see they're growing. You can see that their um, attitude towards life is very, very different to everyone else's. You can feel the difference in them, uh, even when you interact with them. You can feel that, that there is an honour of love and truth, and you can feel that they're not going to compromise love and truth in any way. And you can feel all of those things. And so it becomes very attractive. You, mm -hmm. you, you then feel drawn you, and, and you sort of say to yourself, well, they have that and that looks pretty good to me. So I'd like to have that. And yeah. that's what starts a lot of times the motivation mm -hmm. for somebody to grow. Mm. If people around us are not motivated to grow by looking at us, then most of the time it's because uh, of one of two reasons. One is that we aren't growing and so there's no motivation <laughs> <laughs> coming out of us. And the second one is that they might be afraid of becoming like what we are. Yeah. And of course they don't want to engage that process perhaps. But, but we need to have a good look uh, if things are not changing around us and, if, and in particular if we're not changing and becoming the light of the world, mm. then it's only usually fear or related uh, emotions such as anger and addiction mm -hmm. that present, prevents us from becoming the light of the world. And so that's where we'd need to focus our attention if we truly wanted to grow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a very, it's a very um, powerful thing, isn't it? To mm. have our, to, to make true progress. You, you, you see the difference easily, don't you, between a person who's talking about something in theory yeah. or who understands it in practice and yeah. who displays the benefits <coughs> of it. Yeah. Yes. So Mahanin obviously does that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <coughs> so um, they then launch into a discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, well, first Frederick says to him, uh, you're very kind to think of me because Mahanin's going <laughs> off to something to do something else. Yeah. Oh, thanks for thinking of me. You know, um, I would have thought you'd forgotten about me a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To which Mahanin says, "We never forget here," yes. yeah. um, which is is uh, a lot about. Uh, well, it's talking about the spirit world, really, isn't it? And yeah. the fact that when we're loving, there's no um, 
everyone has equal value, don't they? And also... Yeah, it's not only that. Like, obviously on Earth, um, most people are self-serving. Most people are quite narcissistic and selfish in all of their life. They very rarely think of other people. But the more love you have in your soul, the more you think of other people. And the more you're reflective about what other people are doing and, and how you can assist them in particular. Mm -hmm. so, so that's why in the spirit world, particularly in the higher realms above the first, people start thinking about each other and they start thinking about their interactions with each other, not from a selfish perspective, but more from a perspective of how can we help each other to grow. And we don't see much of that on earth. There's more of a selfish orientation towards seeing another person. You know, what can I get from them? Or what emotion can I get from them? And yeah. What can they do for me? Yeah. Like, is, the, is the common feeling that we have. And we don't have the feeling quite frequently of, of wanting to do things for other people just because we want to assist them and help them, not for any other reason or any addictive reason. Mm -hmm. But in the spirit world, and particularly uh, after you've re released from the first fear, um, it is, there is more consideration of each other and more desire to work together on, in different endeavours generally. And, and particularly when you're on the divine love path in the spirit world, when you're on God's way, mm -hmm. anybody else who's on God's way, you definitely want to assist them. And so my Ian is obviously very interested in assisting Fred yeah. uh, because of the fact that Fred has a desire for truth, he has a desire to love, he has a desire to grow, he demonstrates those desires all the time. And so why wouldn't my yes. Ian think of him? Yes, <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. So then he says, of course I wouldn't forget you. Um, and they, they come into, they start into a discussion about little Limpy Jack mm -hmm. and what's going, what's the transition that's ahead for him. And, um, Mahanin talks about how special and beautiful he finds it when these these ones who've been suffering so much on earth uh, enter the spirit world mm. and what a relief it is for them. Mm. Uh, and he says some things here that I thought <coughs> perhaps I would ask you to speak about. Mm -hmm. Um, again, there's mention of this word compensation, mm -hmm. um, which we've discussed in previous chapters, the mm -hmm. uses of that word. But um, he says, sometimes I almost wish I could feel what passes through the soul of such an one when first he realises what has taken place and fully understands the reality of the change. Mm. So he's talking about when the, when the young children pass. What a revelation of the love of God must seem to overwhelm them. When I think of it, I can almost feel grateful that he has permitted man to sin because nothing else could have opened up the possibility of sounding the matchless grace of his full forgiveness and restoration. Mm -hmm. So within that um, expression there, I felt that Mahani is saying something about just how beautiful the demonstration of God's grace is when these, these kids pass. Yes, yeah, so I suppose what he's really talking about is the contrast between earth life yep. and spirit life, in particular for these kind of children. Obviously, yep. there are many people on earth who have a lovely life on earth, and when they enter the spirit world, they enter the opposite contrast, yes. which is this terrible, torturous existence in the spirit world, having nothing because they have squandered their existence on earth. And mm -hmm. um, in the case of these children, obviously it's opposite. They have been treated cr cruelly and harshly by the environment. You know, their own parents discarded them. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, society itself generally has discarded them. In this case, particularly a hundred years ago, that was often the case. And so, and so what happened is that they have, they have experienced the worst of life on earth. And of course, once they pass into the spirit world, they begin to immediately experience the complete opposite mm -hmm. of that. So the contrast is so great that it pulls the heart of those people generally into realising that God is good. It's just yeah. mankind that are not so good. And it helps them actually see the contrast. Whereas a lot of the people who have had a good life on earth, so-called good life on earth, where they've made lots of unloving choices and decisions to further their own selfish ends, mm -hmm. they pass into the spirit world into the hells. And of course, they think bad, God is bad <laughs> because of that experience. They yeah. think one on earth, they, while on earth, they had a good go. And then when they got to the spirit world, it was all cut off from them. And so they often have the feeling that God is bad. Mm -hmm. um, so it, often it depends on this contrast of what happens on your earth life 
and what happens in the spirit world. But for these children, obviously, it's very different than the average person. And so they have this terrible life on earth and then this beautiful life beginning in the spirit world. And so naturally, that has an effect of affecting, that affects them emotionally, mm -hmm. realizing that actually all the way along, God's actually cared for them, but it's just that nobody else did. And particularly, I mean, nobody else on earth did. Mm. And that's the reason why they had such a difficult existence on earth. Yeah. yeah. And, and I suppose that was the reflection I had in my margin. It was just the contrast between a life on earth that's affected by sin mm. and affected by the sin of others mm. um, as compared to a life in the spirit world that's governed by God and yes. God's love. Yes. Yeah. So in these, ca in these kids' case, the life on earth was affected by the sins of others mostly. Yeah. And in fact, they had learnt l about love through going to the college in the spirit mm -hmm. world. They had learnt about love and actually practiced more of love even when they're on earth than the average adult did while yeah. on earth. Yeah. And as a result, they pass in the spirit world in a much better condition, but also they get to experience the deep contrast between what life was like on earth and what was life is now like in the spirit world because in the spirit world everything's governed with love whereas on earth everything's governed by fear and hatred and envy and strife and jealousy and, and all of the other selfish and narcissistic mm. emotions and so they see the big contrast between those two states mm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah okay and then Frederick asks Mahanin the question about family. Mm -hmm. So he, he basically says to him, like, I was wondering what's going on. Well, I quite like the way he asks this question. Go well, for it. Because I, I think we need to sort of look at that. Because there, Fred has these underlying tendencies still, which come from Earth, to judge certain nations and certain people as more easily influenced or less easily influenced or more wicked or less wicked and yeah, so forth yeah. and he carries that emotional injury into his spirit world state mm -hmm. so naturally when he starts asking the question yeah there's this implication that oh, some countrymen of his might find it easier when they passed compared to other people and so forth right so there's all of these implications even in the yes. asking of the yes. question yeah and yeah. so i i, I think this demonstrates, doesn't it, how in our earth life we're often imbibing attitudes that are unloving and we have no idea they're unloving. Yeah. And in fact, we, we think of them as normal. Mm. We think of them as, yeah, that's the way it is type mm. of thing. We don't even understand that the actual attitude comes from an unloving emotion within us or from uh, what we've been taught from unloving emotions in the environment towards different, you know, in this case, races or, or, or people. And, and in, many in many countries, it's towards the opposite gender as well, where women are treated as weaker, as more stupid than men or whatever. And all of these things cause us to carry those injuries into the spirit world, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If we don't deal with them on earth, they're with us. Mm. Mm. So, um, uh, yeah, I don't know what you're referring to there quite exactly about um, why he thinks uh, Limpy Jack will go to a different place. Is that somewhere in the writing? Uh, it's not that, that he go to a different place, but as you'll find out later, one of the uh, attitudes, I mean in book two, um, <laughs> one of the you got to, I was always wanting people to not skip to book two oh, when we're still on book one. Well, read them all Go so, ahead. so many times. Yeah. But um, one of the attitudes that Fred has that causes him to ask these kind of questions is this attitude about you know w the contrast between what's going on in heaven and what's going on on earth. He, he still sort of thinks that a lot of the things that are going on on earth would happen in heaven. Yeah, he d and, and we saw that plain. a couple of chapters ago, didn't we, where yeah. he was so surprised that the black person kept their skin, yeah, exactly, the colour of their exactly. skin. And that, that's a good and example of what you're And you'll see this continuing even to. into the second book, where, where yeah. he still hasn't progressed beyond those, what, what in the third book are called the taints of the earth life, uh -huh. which are really what you would classify as the emotional injuries that we gather during our earth life. And as a result, he asks some of these questions that he does ask. And, and he's not criticised for them. No. But, but he is, it is pointed out to him that, yeah, sometimes your questions are a bit off, man. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is the real thing going on. <laughs> yeah, mm. yeah. And in a way, it's great, isn't it, that he's been so willing to share that so openly yeah. because it helps us see how, yes. how we behave and how we might behave. So the question I'm referring to is mm -hmm. this question. 
I wondered if he had no father, mother or other relative here to whom he would naturally go. Yes. And the whole concept that we would naturally go to a family member when we passed is a concept deeply flawed yes. uh, for so many reasons, actually, yes. which, which we my hand goes to on to, yeah. to, to explain. Yeah. But that is the earth-based concept that, that we imbibe, most of us imbibe during our life on earth. We do family, family, family is everything. And in fact, in fact, for most people on earth, they don't even consider anyone else other than the family. Mm -hmm. And they are completely unethical in the way they treat the rest of God's family. In other words, they treat their own family with a special priority and everyone else of God's family is treated with a lower priority. Mm -hmm. and, and we've had so many discussions, you and I, haven't we, in private with different people about the unethical behaviour they engage with their own children, yes. treating their own children as if they're special and deserve more money, attention, time, whatever, than another person would deserve. Yeah. And, you know, the reality is from God's perspective, we're all brothers and sisters. We all deserve the right, same amount of attention. We all deserve the same amount of materials, goods and so forth. And, and most people on earth do not think that at all. In no. fact, I would suggest the majority, if not all the people on earth generally don't think that at all. No. Uh, because there is this inbuilt injury that is carried through the earth life that by the time we leave here, we automatically think, where's the family? Well, you know, we'd go to the family, surely, what's going on here? And yeah. this is really what Fred's saying. He's saying, what's going on here? Well, you know, yeah. Why isn't he going to his family? Like, surely he's got a mum and he's got a dad and they've possibly passed. That's probably why he's been alone on earth. Yeah. So why don't they just take him to them? Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah. And he's, uh, it, just before, so he's getting around to that and that's another thing that he does, isn't mm. it? He sort of asks a question and he gets yeah. a bit more information then he's like, oh, I've got to be a bit clearer. Exactly. But if we go back to the information that Mahanin gave him before then, yep. um, Mahanin says, um, he had no, because Fred asks, why was he brought here above all other exactly, places? Yeah. Had he nowhere else to go? <laughs> and uh, Mahanin says, he had nowhere else to go, not that he was an outcast, but because he, like every other person, is subject to a law. Mm -hmm. And this is what I, um, I found, like, I... I like how Mahanin said it. He's like, it's not that there's nowhere else to go and you've gone begging. It's that there's a law that governs that there is no other place that you should go. You should go to this place. Correct. Um, and that's a theme that he then begins to build on in his discussion with mm. Fred. Mm. Um, this idea of law governing what happens to us when we pass mm. and um, the condition of the soul. Yes, and how the condition of the soul in the spirit world is honoured. And, yes. and therefore we everything that's done for that particular person is done in harmony with the condition of their soul yes so if the condition of the soul is really really dark they uh, they wouldn't go to where fred and afra are even uh fred and sorry my are at the moment having a discussion because they couldn't even get there yeah yeah <laughs> and and that's because they wouldn't probably like it there either <laughs> do you know what i mean given the condition of their soul and and that's the same for for this, for this little fellow you know he 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 needs to go to this location he, it, because of certain requirements. One of them being that he needs a person who loves him yes. to care for him and educate him. And the, his family obviously are not in that condition. Mm. Otherwise they would already be doing that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And, and um, so Mahanin begins to talk about these qualities of the soul. Um, and in each condition, there are souls who are specially attracted to us and we to them. Mm. These become our friends and companions, mm. which is really what you were saying there. Mm. But what um, struck me about that paragraph in particular is it the precision of the law. Yes. There's nothing random about anything that's happening. Yep. It's not that he's got nowhere else to go in terms of being an outcast. It's literally that there is not another place that is more suitable to him in his current condition and than to be with the poetess mm. and that her condition is very specifically will be you know aided uniquely, and uniquely uh, uh, individual for the, for his progress yes mm. yeah yeah so mm. <coughs> that the the element of precision and the law i mm. thought um yeah. uh, again it's themes that he begins to build on yes yeah, so i think the issue of the law is very important but mm -hmm. i think there's also the issues of the these emotions we carry from the earth as well and why 
we sort of believe then, once we hit the spirit world, that those laws shouldn't apply. <laughs> so we, we, we often have friends on earth who, who generally don't listen to our, <laughs> to our suggestions and some of them have passed mm -hmm. as a result of not listening to our suggestions. And then when they come and talk to us, they, they say, well, I, you know, I heard divine truth, so why aren't I in a second sphere or why aren't I in a happy place? You know, at the moment I'm getting, I feel terrible and I don't even want to go to where I was assigned and all that. And we say to them, but that's because your soul, that's your condition of your soul. That's what we tried to tell you. Mm -hmm. That is the condition of your soul. Mm -hmm. And they, and they go, but, but, but surely it should be different to that. No, no, it's not different to that. We've always told you that. It's just that you have never understood that properly. Yeah. That your condition of your soul will govern where you go. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's a law that's so exact that, that if there isn't a place in the universe that, that your condition of your soul matches, a place will be created mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> just for you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you, some people pass in such, you know, in, in such a unique condition that there's a unique place in the hells of the spirit world, for example, that are created just for that person. Yeah. Because, because no one else has ever been in that condition before. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's how exact it is. Yeah. It's amazing, isn't mm. it? It's, it, there's a lot of care in that design. Yes. Yeah. By, from God firstly, but also from everyone God directs. Yes. Mm. Yes. Who observe God's laws. Mm. Yeah. Who, who want to live within them yeah mm. okay then he goes on to say about the mother and father mm -hmm. and which was the real question which is the real question he was asking <laughs> he was getting along. around to it yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> and Mahanin begins to say really amazing things and in this chapter you know really i've underlined probably half of all the words <laughs> written <laughs> <Fair> <laughs> because enough. i think we could talk about, talk about all a lot of, of it yeah um but he, he begins to point out the error, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. He politely mentions that you're in a common error there. Mm -hmm. um, and he wants to set him straight. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm going to, you know, to explain it or you're going to be in more trouble. Yes, but uh, what I like about this whole process for, for Afra or, or Fred is, is that he, he eventually states what he really believes. Yes. And, and this is fantastic yeah. because when you really state what you really believe and you have an interest in finding out what the truth is at the same time, mm -hmm. then a person can engage what you believe and compare it to what the truth is. Yes. And this is something that happens to Fred most of the way through his, uh, through his life in yes. the, through the mist, but also all through the other books as well. He's often in a state of error but he's willing to state and ask about what he believes is error. Mm. So in other words, he's not judging his own error. He's not analysing everything. He's about to say, should I ask that? What will, what yeah. will my hearing think if I ask that? What will my hearing feel if I ask that? What, what will they think about me if I ask that? He's yeah. not going through all of that crap. Yes. What he's doing <laughs> is he's, he's sitting there and he's going, I just want to know. And this is what I feel. Yeah. <laughs> and, he, and he expresses himself that. openly yeah. about what he feels. And then he focuses on what, what, what is right, what is wrong. And then the, the beauty of that is the person who's with him feels the desire for the truth. He also feels the error mm -hmm. and has now a beautiful way in which to show him the contrast. And I feel if so many people on earth started to engage that process in that manner, where they're willing to state what they actually think or feel, what, what they truly believe, and then on, on the other hand, are willing to listen to an alternative, <laughs> um, you would have really good engagements with people. But it's interesting, that's not what often happens in our seminars or anything. We feel the fear of many in the audience to even ask a question just in case you know, one of us will, you know, somehow state the error and yeah. then they'll all feel embarrassed and ashamed and everything. And one of the things here is that even when Fred or Afra feels embarrassed or ashamed because of the question or all the stand that he had, he still lets himself feel that emotion and still goes ahead the next time and asks the next question. Yes. Yeah. His desire for truth gets him over a lot of things, exactly. doesn't it? Exactly. And it's a very beautiful quality in him yeah. that I often... Uh, notice and like you said notice how little that quality is displayed on earth yes it's really judged a lot of the time isn't it yes it is yes it yeah. is yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah okay so Mahanin says you must now learn to draw a distinction between relationships of the body and those of the spirit 
<laughs> the latter being the only ties we recognise here. Mm -hmm. um, and so he's he's talking. He begins to talk about a few things. The the idea that. Um, He's just basically saying more eloquently what I've said, who's your daddy and it's God yeah. <laughs> and it's everybody's daddy. So, so why, would you, um, <laughs> why, why would you think that we're not brother and sister? Yeah. You know, that, that's the end result of that discussion, isn't it? Exactly. Um, but it's very eloquent the way <laughs> that he puts it. Puts it yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, look, rather than going through the whole reading it all out, Basically, he brings up two or three important points. Mm. Um, Fred's saying, look, on earth, it's very, very common to believe that you're going to meet up with your family when you go, when you're in heaven. It is. And Mahanine says, well, that's not even logically possible. No. Because once the couple marry, who's their family then? And if they have children, who's their, and if those, and children, those children marry, children marry. Who, who ends up being the family you're reunited with? Exactly. Which is very valid. Are you valid reunited thing. with a whole hundred of thousands <laughs> of them from, from 10 generations past? Or who are <laughs> yeah. you reunited exactly. with? Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, great, great, great Aunt Dorothy. Yeah. I, do, you, do you know? <laughs> who you never met. Who you never met. Are you that interested yeah. in meeting her? Yeah. And he, he basically says that there's another thing that brings people together. And that's actually common affection, common interest, a common desire. Yes. And um, that that's better. Yes. And actually... You that actually works on earth too, by the way. Yeah. It's just prob often not allowed to work on earth because of the family mm -hmm. in many cases. Mm -hmm. It's like many times if you went and in, in engaged a life with somebody else, you know, who your family disapproves of, you go, often get ridiculed and rubbished and even excommunicated by your family when you do that, right? And this is something that normally happens on earth. Um, and yet it doesn't have to happen. If the family on earth was more allowing of all these relationships developing, oftentimes by the time a child's 20, they might not see their children very frequently because yeah, their children are off, a parent I'm yeah, talking about now yeah. on earth, may not see their child very frequently because the child's off doing this thing with this friends and doing that thing with that and, and really connecting to their soul and engaging all the things they love. And, and that's different to the things that the parents love. Yeah, mm. yeah. And that's, but of course that doesn't happen on earth, why? Mostly because of the indoctrination that we receive from our family, isn't it? Yeah, to tell us that we have a duty and we're bound, and we're bound to, to these them. people. Yes. Yeah. And, and also there's this implication on earth that if you uh, do not spend much time with your family, then you don't have much love in you. Mm -hmm. And that's not true at all. In the spirit world, there's plenty of people with huge amounts of love in them. In fact, they're at one with God, so they've got large amounts of love. And they've never spent any time with their family for the last 2,000 years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. so the reality is spending time with your family isn't the, a judge of, of love. It's in, it, all it is is a, an indication that, if, that you're either drawn to them, mm -hmm. if it's a pure decision, mm -hmm. or you feel forced to be with them. <laughs> it's one of those two things. Yeah, yeah. And, and if we feel truly drawn to them, we won't feel a feeling of obligation towards our family. Yeah. If we felt truly drawn to them, we'd just want to have, spend some time with them without feeling obliged to spend some time with them. Yeah. Just like we do with anybody else. Because from God's perspective, we are all family anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that, as like Mahanin says it very eloquently in yeah. very beautiful terms. And he also says that under that system, if you really you feel happy for other people in your family because you know they're off doing things that make them happy rather Correct. than yeah. feeling bound. And I feel that's another problem on earth. Oftentimes the family isn't happy <laughs> that somebody from the family has gone off doing the things they like or want because there's a, often a feeling in many parents of, I don't want you to go and have to do what you want. Nobody's allowed to on earth do what they want. I wasn't allowed to do what I want, so I'm not going to let you do what you want either <laughs> type of feeling coming, a feeling of rage coming mm -hmm. from the parent towards the child. And so that's many times they are the direct impediment to the child doing what they want. Yeah. Um, with, that's not the case in the spirit world. Nobody impedes a person's pure desire to do the things that they love to do. Yeah, mm. yeah. Which is welcome news, I think, for many, <laughs> many probably, <laughs> on earth. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, and then Mahanin builds on this theme and he says, 
every individual soul born into our life has become, by its life on earth, self-conditioned. And God has provided for it, having respect to two facts only. Mm. And these two things is what I was uh, think there's some worthy discussion involved mm -hmm. in these two things. First, the law which ever works to secure holiness. Mm -hmm. And the next, the means to attain that condition under the most favourable circumstances to the individual. Yes. So really he's saying there's, it's, there's law. And it, you and I know it's not one law. It's, it's a group, a group of, of laws. laws. Yeah, the, law, the law like of love, you could call it. The law of love. Mm -hmm. And like we say here, there's... It's a, like a collective now, the law. Yeah. It's the law of the land. Yeah. This law, that's this law of love that governs this, the spirit world. Yeah, it's the law of the land in yeah. the spirit world. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> um, which is designed to bring everyone towards holiness, which is really... Yeah, or to state it more probably purely, it's designed to bring everyone into a higher condition of love, which is what oh, the de desire yeah. to be more holy really is. Yes. To come into a higher condition of love. So... The law for everyone is designed to bring them into a higher condition of love. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, number one. Yes, and that means that you want, to, you want that to happen under the most favourable circumstances possible. Correct. And so this law governs where you go when you pass because yeah. it's not, oh, I want to go and visit my family. It's there's a law governing because that law dictates who I'm with is going to mean the mo that I'm under the most favourable circumstances to grow towards love. Yes. To grow towards becoming more loving. Yes. Of course, that's I I assuming that I accept the allocation of my space in the <laughs> spirit world and many don't and that's why they're earthbound for a period of time beforehand. Yes, mm. yeah, because sometimes when we have strayed far from love on earth, mm -hmm. the, condi the, the conditions most favourable for our growth in the spirit world are, are the, hells. the hells that reflect to us the, the consequences and implications of our unloving actions. Correct. And so a lot of people don't want to face that and no. they go, oh, I'm going back to earth. Exactly. Um, but, but even the hills are the most favourable yes. location for a person in that condition. It's like if you put the person in the hills into the second sphere or third sphere, they'd create havoc. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the reason why God created this kind of system. So these people are placed exactly in the position. They're attracted and drawn exactly to the position that's going to have the most positive benefit to help them learn about love. Yeah. And whether they accept that or not is yeah. really up to them, up to their free will. So they can choose to accept that and then work with that, or they can choose to fight against that, rebel against that, and their condition may even worsen them. Mm -hmm. that, you know, until they get to a stage where the pain is so great, they stop and they go, oh, now I better learn about love. Yeah. <laughs> at some point, we're all going to have to go, now I better learn about love, at yeah. some point. Yeah. And, and so for some, so that point is like, unfortunately, terrible you know they have to get to such a sad terrible condition before they desire to do that and for others uh, it, they want to do that while on earth and so they start growing in love while on earth and 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 in fact all the laws reflecting around the earth are all designed to help you do that as well mm -hmm. uh, unlike most what most people think mm -hmm. yeah exactly they're all designed the same way yeah i i that's one of the most beautiful things that i see in god's design is that there's always laws acting upon us to bring mm. us towards love. Like mm. how loving is a parent who's designed absolutely everything in your environment to draw you closer to love mm. and to love of yourself, love of others, love of even God mm. herself. Yeah. And the reality also is if it's not easy for us to love, then it's because we're using a lot of resistance to love. Yeah. Because the reality is all of God's laws support us being loving. Mm -hmm. So if we're finding it hard to be loving, then it's because we're in a lot of resistance to love. It's not, not for any other reason. It's not like God made this terrible universe and it's really hard to love in it. <laughs> it's completely the opposite of that. God made this wonderful universe. It's really quite easy to love in it once you're willing to do so. Yeah. That's the key thing. And so this is like the first part of this sentence that you read. He's really showing that, ah, oh, okay, this is the law that governs the land. And it doesn't just govern the land of the spirit world. It governs the land here too. But unfortunately, most people on earth ignore that law mm -hmm. in ha in, uh, in, in, and substitute for it the law of this land, yes. which is often very selfish and, 
and also often very destructive. Mm -hmm. Or they substitute, and most people do this, they substitute their own law, yeah. <laughs> which is, I want to do whatever I want anytime, <laughs> thank you very much, and, and, uh, and I'll work out any excuse for doing it. And unfortunately, because of that, they have no idea that this law is still governing their still soul, still affecting their condition, and as a result, it's going to rapidly determine once they arrive in the spirit world where they should, where they should exist. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, and then I suppose there's that second aspect, isn't it, that he mentions there? Mm -hmm. The me the means to obtain that condition under the most favourable circumstances. And so that, that's the second aspect of it. So there's this law based on your soul, but then there's also the provision of the means. And every single person, if, if, if every single person on earth knew that no matter what they chose to do on earth, once they pass, even if they pass into the hills, surrounding them will be the means for them to learn how to become more loving. Yeah. And they knew that there will be people available to them if they call on them, if they really want to become more loving. So they, every, every time they exercise a pure desire to change, there, there is all the things given to them that they need to change. Mm -hmm. All of the things given to them. And if they knew that, then they'd probably be less afraid of dying. They'd be less afraid of the spirit world. And also they'd be more reflective about their life on earth here, I feel. Because they'd, they'd want to choose to do things more in harmony with love here, so they prepare themselves for their arrival in the spirit world. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So what he's talking about in this one paragraph has a huge impact upon I know. people if they allowed themselves to to, con to contemplate the information. Yes, <coughs> and mm. th the next two pages really, I feel there is so much that if you really consider what is being said and apply it to life right now, mm -hmm. it would affect a lot of the way you, yeah, mm. the way you live and act and even the faith that you have in God. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so he's really saying in the next paragraph that I can only see the possibility well, in the future. I don't know. I know that families don't hang out together. He's saying. Yeah. I know from that from his own experience. From my own experience, <laughs> yeah. I know there's this other thing that draws people together. Yeah. Um, but and in the future, I don't know. Except, I can see the possibility of forming groups of twin souls, in one great family of heaven, mm. until many st other stages have been passed. Mm. And of course. Really, he's talking about soulmates there. Correct. Yeah. He's talking about the soulmate relationship yep. and the fact that there it exists yep. and, that, uh, and that eventually it won't be just one half of the soul that meets into a group and uh, is attracted to a certain group while the other half is completely neglected. Yep. It'll be that the two halves are drawn together and then those two collectively will draw other two halves together. Yes, yes. in groups. In groups. Yes. yes. And... Um, and there are relationships. Their relationships are rightly termed. That's a typo there, I think. No, their, as in the place. Mm -hmm. Their relationships are rightly termed blood relationships. But flesh and blood cannot enter this life and therefore kinship has to be lifted unto, into another more spiritual bond of, the, of God the Father we are born into the Spirit and thus become brethren and sisters of one great family of heaven. Mm -hmm. So he's saying, really, the real blood relationships are the soulmate relationships. Correct. And, and that's, that's makes where you sense. begin with your family. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. And um, yeah, that's really cool. And we know that to be true. <laughs> <laughs> You're a bit blase about that one. <laughs> it's one of I'm the, I feel it's one of the most essential truths as well about the universe. You see, I feel a, a lot of people on earth and particularly a lot of people again who come along to our seminars are ignoring totally this relationship, this soulmate relationship. They're not wishing to resolve the question as to who their soulmate is because they're afraid of resolving such questions. They're not wishing to progress towards meeting their soulmate or being with their soulmate in a soul connection. And the, and, and the reason why they're not is because they're not engaging their true nature and desire. And, and if they had of, they would be finding themselves automatically through the law being drawn to the other half of themselves. Yeah. So it's, to me, it almost feels like on the planet, 
because there's so much injury around the issue of family, there is um, a lot of us are not living connected to our true nature and desires and personality because instead we've taken on from our families the type of people we feel that we should be, mm -hmm. the type of life we feel Which that we should more live. probably the type of people they feel we should be. <laughs> That's what I mean. We've not taken that. It's their yeah, impressions it's their of who impression. we should be that dictate the most of our life. Mm. What we do for a job, how we live, how we spend our money, how we spend our time. Yeah. For most people on the, the earth right now... the desires we engage more importantly. Because it's a lot about the desires, isn't it? Meeting the other half of yourself is about you engaging your pure desires and living in harmony with your pure desires. And you can't meet the other half of yourself if you, if you don't engage that in some way. Yes, yes. Mm. I suppose I see all those things as an expression of your desire. Yeah. How you spend your time, your job, all of those things. That's True. all based on what you do, isn't it? Yeah. On what you want to do. And yeah. But often the times that, unfortunately, like you pointed out, it is what our parents want us to do, not what we want to do. So yeah. it's not really what we want, it's what they want yes. for us. And, and and as a result, we finish, up, we finish up being way, way away from the other half of ourselves. <laughs> Yeah, I suppose that's what I wanted to say is that it seems like we live as products of a family unit rather than a, uh, or of a set of family injuries about the type of person we should be. We take that on mm. and then we don't, unless we challenge that, we don't end up operating under the laws that, like these laws that operate in the spirit world have the potential to operate upon us here on earth, well, don't they? do they? operate here. But like we I, fight them, don't we? We fight them. That's yeah. what we do. We're fighting against them. We're yeah. actually, and that's what makes our life more difficult, of course, because we're fighting against them. It's not, it, like, it, like I said earlier, if we were naturally doing what the law stated, things would be a lot smoother in our lives, actually, because all of the laws are there to make our lives more smooth if we love. Mm -hmm. and, and part of this soulmate relationship is about love. There's a lot you learn in that relationship about love that you cannot learn in any other relationship. And so when you're avoiding that relationship, what you're really doing is you're, you're shutting down a large portion of these law, laws. You're working against them. Mm. And while you're working against them, you're going to experience the pain of working against them, of course, which means that most of your relationships will be difficult and, and hard to, to engage. And when you meet your soulmate because you're avoiding all of the laws, you, you know, you, even that relationship is going to be difficult to engage until you start engaging the law. Yep. and start seeing that all of God's laws are perfectly in harmony with love, all aimed towards helping you grow in holiness, as the quote is here, or grow further in love. Yeah. 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 It's just a beautiful system, I feel. And so do I. I feel that, like we often, like when we speak to people about soulmates, there's some people who you speak to about it who you can feel they have an opening towards the other half of themselves. And so, and so they are attracted to conversation about who is the other half of myself? What, what, you know, what are they doing right now? What, what emotions and desires do I need to connect to in order to meet them? And they're very interested in those conversations. But then there's quite a large majority of people actually who have no desire at all to meet the other half of themselves and are working actively in the opposite direction to these laws. And, for, and then they come up with all sorts of justifications, like, you know, what's going to happen to my current relationship? What if my current relationship isn't a soulmate relationship? You know, and all, all these questions get asked one after the other, implying that God is somehow unloving in creating this particular mm. aspect of our growth. And yet the reality is all we're doing is fighting the most loving person in the universe cre who created this loving law, which will assist us to grow. And it makes no sense to, to me, but, but I see m a lot of people doing this all the time. You know, this is why there are many single people who come along to our seminars, because they're already fighting that law. Mm. They're already fighting this concept as well. And, and so they come up with excuses for their concept as well. They're earth-based excuses for the concept, such as, you know, what's going to happen to my family? What's going to happen to my children? Well, won't you love them still? Won't you love whoever you're with right now still? If you if you have if you person who you're with right now is not your soulmate and you meet your soulmate, won't you have a loving way of dealing with that information? 
if you really had a desire to love, you would. Mm -hmm. right? mm. So there should be no trauma in, in the sort out of all of that stuff if everyone involved really wanted to love. Yeah, mm. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And this is what I see as a main problem about these questions. Like, I remember when I first met you, the, the whole soulmate issue was pretty much off the table, wasn't it? And, and I feel that's the case for many people. Like, they, they live in this place where they, they want to have the right to select the other half. And while you're allowed to have the right to select the other half, because that's free will, at the end of the day, if the other half that you've selected is not your real other half, yeah, <laughs> it's going to be a bit pointless in the long run. <laughs> well, the truth is you can't select your other half. It's already done. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's, it's finished. It's done and dusted. By the time you... <laughs> You've got a body, that's it, it's, it's over. Well, even before then, it's over. But, <laughs> but I mean, yeah, that's yeah. right, that's right. It's, yeah. it's, it's not anything that's within your control. And you and can if spit you at God and you know, condemn God for creating such a system, but at the end of the day, God is the most loving being in the universe. God would have created this system for loving reasons. And, and, and most people who are not honouring that are not trusting God, in fact. Yeah. They don't trust that God will help them through to sort out any issue that might arise as a result of that issue. I also think that a lot of us hate ourselves because of our, yeah. our true selves, I mean. True. Our, yeah. our so the worst uh, thing is to meet the other half. <laughs> <laughs> They're just another person that we hate. <laughs> yeah, if I can explain that a little sure, bit more sure. for the viewer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when we grow up in a family that we have our unique personality that God created within us. But yeah. if our family unit doesn't um, encourage or even like those parts of us, then we can internalise that and start to hate the, the, our very true nature. And so then mm. meeting the other half of us isn't attractive because they are just reflecting to us what we don't like about what ourselves. we don't like about ourselves or to be again more more accurate Precise, yeah. what our parents don't like about us <laughs> yes that we've taken on you yeah know. and unfortunately and we meet the other half of ourselves and there's now two people that the parents won't like yes <laughs> basically yes and and we are often so addicted to getting approval from our family that that we will deny the characteristics and traits that we have within ourselves that are also within the other half of ourselves just for the sake of maintaining this relationship with our parents which is actually not who are not our parents at all because god is mm -hmm. and who are basically harming us yeah. in this in this projection or in these desires that they have to, for us to not be who we really are yeah so so you know there's a whole set of problems there as a result if you look at all of the different emotional injuries that afra had here yeah. asking these questions they are all imbibed in the actual relationship between parents and children which also then means that by the time uh, the second half of the child comes along the parents are already got their clear ideas of what they like about that other half and what they don't yeah <laughs> yep and 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 if that other half has been developed in the different directions uh because they had freedom to develop in different directions than you then of course you're also going to be quite challenged because now you've got to go against your parents yeah in order to enter this relationship yeah and for most people that's almost you know that's almost the thing you've got to avoid at all costs absolutely and it's only after they pass in the spirit world that they start entertaining the concept yeah that they're allowed to engage a relationship with the other half of themselves no matter what their parents think <laughs> but even then it ta it's not a magical thing that happens once no. a person passes they still have to deal with those emotional um, injuries systems, yeah. and false beliefs that they took on during mm. their childhood yeah. um, this is why parenting is such an important job isn't it well uh, yeah I, I think we shouldn't call it a job myself I think we should just call it in, 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 in uh, a, an institution that's been created by people on earth in order to manipulate and control little little new souls that God has placed on the earth and and in the end the true parent is God so we shouldn't even call it parenting because God's already doing the parenting <laughs> all we need to do is the brother and sistering <laughs> <laughs> you know in other words we need to see each other as brothers and sisters yes but we all we, but I do feel that God created parent uh, like this the process of having a child and being if it was done in a pure way you would be more progressed in love you in terms of understanding god as a parent uh, and understanding yourself but you as wouldn't a soul. see yourself as a parent at all no but you you would if you were a good brother or sister 
want to impart the wisdom that you had, wouldn't Correct. you? Correct, which yes. a good brother or sister would want to do. Yes. You'd, yes. Want to, you'd want to be able to impart the things you have learned about your parent yep. and about the universe that your parent created and all the things you haven't learned you'd be honest about and all the things you disagreed with you'd be honest about <laughs> instead of trying to force them down the throats of, of the little brother or sister that you've yeah. now brought into the world. Yeah. And so this is where I feel... You know, one of the main problems with parenting is that we've got to get away from the idea that we can parent. <laughs> yeah. Because we're not parents. Yeah. Literally, we're not parents. No. And even when we've, even when we give birth to a child, we are not parents. God is the parent. We are the surrogate. We are the surrogate, and we're only a brother or sister to this child. Mm -hmm. And we don't have the right to do anything with this child that God wouldn't do. Yes. <laughs> so this is something we also need to consider. Yeah. And I feel that, again, that's one of the major injuries on earth. There is this feeling amongst parents that they have the right, that there's ownership, that they have the right to do whatever you like. And quite often you hear, and you've even had it said to yourself, you're my daughter. I basically, you've got to do what I say. You've got to listen to me. No, you don't. No, I'm sorry, you don't. You've got to listen to God sooner <laughs> or later. But even then, God doesn't say you've got to. God says, you, you can listen to me or not. You're going to experience the pain of not listening to me if you don't. So mm -hmm. it's a free will choice. God doesn't ever say you've got to. So, so the fact that a parent is saying they've got to is already out of harmony with love. Yeah. So, you know, I feel this paragraph, this chapter is so good in terms of highlighting many of these errors, the Absolutely. errors with regard to soulmates, the errors with regard to family, the errors with regard to who your friends really are, and all of these errors, like they're yeah. all just highlighted in one chapter. And I doubt whether many people who have read the chapter have given it that much consideration. No, <laughs> and I, I wish I myself was a little bit better prepared for this chapter because there is so much in it, like I said, mm -hmm. and I haven't had much time this week. But uh, if we keep going, um, Frederick now exposes himself in another <laughs> way, showing another one of his injuries. Yes, he says... Yes. <gasps> Would you tell this to people on Earth, what you've just told me? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what a terrible mess it will create on Earth if people know the truth. Yep. <laughs> and my name says, well, of course yes, I would. I would. <laughs> <laughs> because it w isn't it the thing that would actually bring people together? Yes. It would, and, and I agree with him yes. wholeheartedly. Yes. Um, you know, that, that not only that, Family is a, a earth-made construct, yes. and that the real family is every, we're all brothers and sisters, but also that all of God's laws are acting to bring us towards love, yeah. and at all yeah. times, and we have the means to do that. Yes, yeah, and yeah. and he's really alluding a lot of way through the chapter, of course, uh, to my words in the first century, where I said that you know my brother or sister or mother or father are those who listen to the to to God and do what. God's laws dictate basically yeah and you know do the will of God is how it's quoted in the Bible but the the reality is that they do become your true mother father brother or sister it's not your family but rather the people who become your family through attraction yeah and and it's those those who are attracted to growing in love and if you're attracted to growing in love they'll become your family but those who are attracted to evil still and if you're attracted to evil, they'll become your family. Yes. And it doesn't matter what you say, you know, you want to go and see your family. Well, no, they are your family. They are the ones who have the same way of thinking you do, the same way of doing things that you do. They are the ones who have the same unloving condition or loving condition that you have. And so they become your family. Yeah. That's the true family. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And he says here in the following paragraph, that pure affection, whether between members of the same family or not, is an attribute of the spirit and not of the flesh mm -hmm. um, and can only be secured or dissolved by spiritual approachment or estrangement. Yes. And that is pretty profound in terms of the fact that most of us think that even outwardly displays of affection and family going to family gatherings and doing the right thing and getting <laughs> mum the mother's day gift and all yeah, of these all things that, that equates to affection and, and my is saying it's not no it's a spiritual thing yeah. and it is affection really he's saying it's based in like if we term spirituality as growth in love yes 
It's about something that originates in your heart. Mm. And whether you have it for your family member or for someone else, that's the thing that binds people together here. Y yes. Yeah. And, that, and that surely is something that everyone could see logically because it, it, it makes no... It, like, if you think about the average person on Earth, they go along to a family do, you know, like as we call them here in Australia. Well, I don't know what they call them overseas, a fa family function or a family yeah. gathering. And, and most of the people going along don't really want to be there. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And there's usually fights and arguments and all of the unhealed stuff that's happened all the way through the life of that family gets usually brought up mm -hmm. <laughs> during the period or ignored completely. Yeah. So everyone's just says, detune and have a beer or, or something like that. And nobody's really connecting with each other love. They might have brought gifts even, but there's no real love connection in that place. So what's the point in having them? There's no point in having them unless there is a love connection. Mm -hmm. And you don't have them just because mummy wants one or dad wants one or brother and sister need one or something. You do it because you, love draws you to do it. And so in the spirit world, of course, that's exactly what happens. There, you know, so there's far less parties with family <laughs> in the spirit world than there is parties with family here on earth as a result because the parties in the spirit world all happen amongst the people who are all drawn to the same location for the same at the same time for a similar purpose yeah and it's got nothing to do whether your family are there or not yeah mm. yeah yeah and you know uh, the other thing that he keeps saying is that that's a good thing it's a great thing <laughs> it's, a yeah. great. it's a great thing <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah so i suppose then the Frederick's displaying kind of throughout the rest of this chapter. He's concerned that if you tell people that there's not eternal damnation or it's not all as soon as you pass, that there's still possibilities for you to grow in love and mm. to be closer to God and stuff. Um, he's worried about that. Like, yeah. what, what's that going to mean? I was wondering before we go to that, though, where, where, where we just talk about this the whole concept of oh the last repentant soul well no no, no the concept of um the fact that like he w this child who who has now pa who, who is in the process of passing yep um he can see his parents if he wants to see his parents yes but it is highly unlikely he will even want to see his parents yep when there is no love bond that would draw him to his parents. Mm -hmm. So even though he, he can see them if he wants to, it is highly unlikely that he even wants to. Yeah. Because it, the love, the only thing that would draw him to seeing the parents is the love that would be in the parents for him. And it's pretty obvious that the parents probably didn't have love for him for him to be going to somewhere else other than his parents. Yes. Otherwise, he possibly would be going to his parents to learn and, and so forth. So it's quite obvious that, that even the question, is it possible he will never see his parents again, is again another demonstration of another injury of Fred's. Like, yeah. what, if we don't give him to the parents now, does that mean he'll never see his parents? <laughs> well, of course not. Of yeah. course, it doesn't mean that at all. Yeah. It means that while there are no, there's no bond of common desire or love, that he'll probably un not want to see his parents, but he has the freedom to see his parents whenever he wants, as long as his parents are in a, in, in a, a darker condition than he is, he can go to them anytime. And if they were in a brighter condition than he was, then they'd probably likely be with him already. <laughs> so, so of course he may see them at some point in the future. The question becomes, would he really want to? Mm -hmm. and, and if most people on earth were honest about their family, they'd have to ask themselves the question, do I really want to see them? <laughs> and, and the, the, you know, if most people were frank with themselves and honest with themselves about their true feelings towards their family, they'd probably go, maybe I don't really want to see them, at least while they're like they are. <laughs> do you know? Yeah, and and this is something that we don't consider on earth. It goes, we feel there's some, there's some kind of love-based obligation, but it's not a love-based obligation. It's an addictive-based obligation. It's a codependent obligation that causes us to feel that we need to visit people who obviously don't care about us or obviously don't have similar desires to us. Or even if they do care about it, obviously they don't have similar interest. Mm -hmm. Like, why would you want to see such people? Like, I don't see any problem with not seeing such people. You, might, you see the people who you, want to have, who mm -hmm. you have interest with. 
So I yeah, feel I agree. Again, the I just I feel like I lived so much in my life um, in an effort to please those people around me. I live so far detuned from my desires. It yeah. You know, it, I had to be searingly honest with myself mm. about how I really felt in those situations because mm. I think I felt like that was the only way I was going to get any approval or mm. love yeah. was to emulate the desires of those people I grew up with yeah. when in fact a lot of them were not my own at all. Yeah. So it takes, it does take development doesn't it in yourself and yes. in in fostering and also development of your own will to a large degree doesn't it because you you have to honor the fact that oh, i'm not really drawn there yes. like I, I remember I, I know you've said to me that often you'd go home and you'd get asthma straight away and when you were away from home there was no asthma yeah and and there's an indication that obviously there's a feeling of oppression at home that's not yeah. there when you're away and and so when you're honest with yourself you go okay i go home i get asthma I'm away, I don't get asthma. There's got to be some reason why I get an asthma here, right? Yeah. There's some kind of physical response to the environment. So it's got to be related to the oppression that I feel when I go home. Mm -hmm. and, and why do I feel so suppressed, uh, you know, suppressed when I go home? Because I am suppressed <laughs> when I go home. <laughs> you know that? And do I want this anymore? And this is where most people don't use their will. What they do is they think by that not going home, for whatever reason, means they don't love the family anymore. It doesn't. It doesn't mean that at all. It just means that you no longer want to put up with the fact that you're not loved anymore. Yes. That you, know, that you don't want to put up with the control and the manipulation anymore. That's all. And when the control and manipulation stops, I'm sure you'd be re-attracted to, the, to them because they're people from your past and you'd want to catch up with them again. And this is where I see, uh, you know, a lot of people are in that boat on earth, but they completely deny that feeling that they have. Yeah, that's what I was referring to, yeah. just that even having the feeling, even though it existed within me, mm -hmm. most certainly, but me having the feeling was so scary. And felt you felt guilty, I felt you felt like selfish, you weren't loving, you selfish. Yep. But they are all emotions that the parent created in order to for you to have to spend time with them yep. in the first place. And yep. that's the ironic uh, irony of this is that is that quite frequently the very emotions we're feeling weren't even created by ourselves in the beginning. They were created by the parent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I find it's, it, Family relationships have, have got to make severe changes on earth in order for there to be any happiness here on earth. Yeah. 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 And, that, and that's pretty self-evident, I think, because the majority of people's hardships, problems and, uh, and feelings are all revolving around how they were t treated generally as children mm -hmm. through their family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, so really in answer to the question that you just raised earlier about whether, whether Limpy Jack was going to see his family again, mm -hmm. um, Mahanin answers that in very eloquent terms. Yes. And he says actually that he has a vision for the future where all families will be reunited because everyone will have come to want God and to want God's way. And to also and want love. And love, to, want to want love. love. Yeah. And to repent and to to yeah. want to love and and so he sees heaven complete this yes. this beautiful concept yes. that where every soul will be drawn together and in that way yeah all families will come together naturally yeah naturally so because yeah. the more you're drawn to God it's like you're drawn closer to each other as you're drawn to God there is this the common concept among some people who think about free will and they think that because we have free will that you know you people are not going to be drawn together. I know there's many people who are interested in the Paget messages who, and who read them. And I've often have a look at their forums, you know, in the past and, and seen that they've talked about how it seems that we can't cooperate with each other. It's because we all have so individual personalities. No, it's not. It's because you don't love. Yes. <laughs> it's because you haven't learnt how to love and you haven't received God's love, even though you're claiming to. Because th the reality is when you receive God's love and when you actually, when it touches your soul, you're drawn together with other people who are in the same condition. You're not repelled by them. You don't push e each other away and you cooperate easily win that state mm. it's really easy to cooperate with people who have the same condition of love as yourself yeah 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 mm. yep it's a very important point um, 
Um, I suppose I would like to have a break. Would you? Yes. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a break then. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we've just taken a short break and we'll get back into our chapter. Pit stop. Pit stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we were just up to the part in the chapter where... Um, he asked whether it's possible we would never see his parents again. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I feel the next paragraph is very important for parents mm -hmm. <laughs> if they ever <laughs> want to see their children again. <laughs> and that is that he states quite clearly that it's about repentance from the, from the parents' perspective. He says, in such visions, I have seen the last repentant soul of earth approach the throne while all heaven was silent in the presence of the awe-inspiring joy that by his forgiveness, that's God's, of his last sin, God was about to add the final touch to the glory of the redeemed. So here he's speaking about, really he's also alluding to, the, th the conditions under which the child will see his parents. Yes. And, and the only conditions under which the child in this case, and in every case in fact in the spirit world, will see his parents, uh, aside from there being some codependent addiction, is when the parents themselves has repented for their actions that they have perpetrated that were unloving towards the child. Mm -hmm. That's the only time, in fact, the child will feel drawn to see its parent. Yeah, at the beginning of this book, we saw um, right after Fred had passed through the mist, we actually saw an example of a mother and one or two of her children. Mm. Um, the mother had just passed and mm -hmm. the children had obviously worked through enough that they had forgiven her mm -hmm. for what happened on earth. And they actually approached her. Approached her but she herself couldn't face them. Correct, because she wasn't yet repentant. Yes. If she was repentant, she could have come to them. Yes. Yes. And, but she, and that's a very powerful demonstration, isn't it, of how even when someone has forgiven the other, mm -hmm. and even sometimes because that person has forgiven them and mm -hmm. can love them, mm -hmm. um, that is so confronting in terms of the error that's inside of that person that they can either choose to, it can be very powerful, they can deal with the emotion, yeah. or they have to run. Yes, and, yeah. and the most do run. Yeah, That's the reality, and, that, and that's the reason why it's highly unlikely that, that this child will see his parents until his parents reach that condition of repentance. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, and if you think about it on earth, it, it, the same thing applies really. Who really wants to see a, a parent who's, who's attacked, browbeaten, been violent towards them, or even abuse them, right? Whoever wants to see that parent again until that parent would no longer perpetrate those same actions and, uh, and is also sorry for those actions that they've committed in the past. Who would want to see the parent? No one, really. If they're in the right mind, they wouldn't want to yeah. see the parent. So, so the same applies, of course, in the spirit world. And, and I think there's a big message for parents there, actually, for our parents in the, in the audience listening. And that is, if you want to see your children after they've passed and after you've passed, unless you are sorry for the things you've perpetrated towards them and you're sincerely repentant for them, it's highly unlikely you're going to see them. Mm. And, and that's a fa fact that you'll have to face at some point in your future. There are many, many billions of spirits who have passed and have passed for even tens or hundreds of years afterwards. They've never seen their children again. Yeah because they're not repentant for what they did to their own children. Yeah. And if you can't be repentant for what you did to your own child, how are you ever going to be repentant for what you did to anything else <laughs> or anybody else? Exactly. It's, you know, if your own child's uh, plight and hardship uh, doesn't trigger you somehow and connect your heart to the fact that you treated somebody badly, if your own child can't do that, then, then how is anybody else ever going to do that for you? Yeah. And this is the reason why many of these parents who passed never see their children for many years, tens, hundreds, and sometimes thousands of years, never see yeah. them again. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's only, like I know for myself, it was actually a growth in love for me to say, I can't see my parents anymore. They're mm. treating me so unlovingly and so unkindly. And they're I not sorry for doing so, so they're going to continue it. Yeah, they're justifying it. Yeah. I wouldn't accept this behaviour from anyone, anyone else. else. So why do I keep... And it was a growth in love for me. So mm -hmm. I, 
until they demonstrate that from a soul perspective that's going to change, mm. the love of myself governs that behaviour. Yes. It's, yeah. it's, it's crazy even, to think that it should be Even love of way. the principle should guide, guide the behaviour too, yeah. though, because there is a principle involved, and the principle is if a person isn't sorry for the actions they have previously taken towards you, then it's highly likely they will continue those same actions towards you. And if you stay in that environment, you are assisting them to continue those same actions towards you. Yeah. So in other words, you're assisting them really to be unloving towards you. Yeah. And so uh, there's a principle also involved. It's not just the principle of love of self, but also the principle of love of the other person. Yes. You would not allow them to continue doing this, give them the space to continue doing the same thing mm -hmm. when it's quite obvious that it's damaging to not only yourself, but also to their to own soul. Yeah. So you wouldn't do it. And so there's a lot of principles involved in the reasons why it's like this in the spirit world. And it should also be like this in the f on earth. Mm -hmm. The reality is that many countries have this concept that, they, that, that when a parent has been violent towards a child, you take away the child temporarily, but the end goal is to get the child back with the parent. Why, for goodness sake? <laughs> if the parent hasn't demonstrated any for repentance yep. for their behaviour, why would you ever want that child going back to the parent? Yep. You'd, you'd not want the child to ever see the parent again, if possible, mm. just so the parent can see the, the, the badness and the evil of their own behaviour yep. and also develop at some point some desire within themselves to change it. Yep. So, so, you know, like my son Tristan works in this in the social uh, worker industry yeah. and, and he's quite often frustrated with the fact that he's just helping the child get to have some self-esteem and get to have some self-love and self-care and then bang the child's back with the parent again and all of what was just done gets undone and lo and behold usually a few months later the parent finishes up treating the child exactly the same way as they treated the child before because mm -hmm. the parent hasn't had repentance mm -hmm. and so then the whole thing has to happen all again and by this time the child's more hurt more more disappointed with the entire system and we could avoid all of that if we had the bravery to go through the process differently and if we had really it's the courage to love yeah we wouldn't do that yeah but you know because of this family focus that we have here on earth we want to always get them back with their own family and and it's such a, s a silly concept particularly when the family have been the ones that have harmed the, the child yeah well in that case yeah. in that case there yeah why would you put you would never put a person in an abusive situation no so why and would particularly you put a child, a child. in one? Yes. Exactly, yeah. particularly uh, a child. Um, when I say a person, you never put an adult in back an into abusive an abusive situation. situation. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and honestly, many of us have to come to terms with the fact that most of uh, the parents have been abusive at one time or another. Yeah. And we do need, under God's laws in the future, we will need to come to a point of repentance about this. As and parents. As parents. Mean, and yeah. this is a great message for parents. Yeah. The only way you are going to be able to deal with your child, your relationships with your children, is to enter repentance. It's not about forgiving your child. No. It's about repenting for what you did to your child. Yeah. So forget about forgiving your child, because yeah. many of you think forgiving your child is the way to go. No, it's repenting for what you did to your child is going to have the yeah. mo most benefit towards them. And, and we need to see that as it really is. Yes. Now, we're going to, in our assistance groups coming up, we're going to discuss what we call, what we're going to call the repentant relationship yes. and the forgiveness relationship yeah. and the, re the relationships in which we need to repent and the relationships in which we, where we need to focus on forgiving. forgiving. And, and these concepts are very important for your future if you really want to engage love and also progress, but also important if you want to see your children again yes. after you've passed, yes. because you won't see them again if you don't enter, particularly if you've been p particularly violent or pushy or demanding uh, on your children. You won't see them for a long time until you work through these issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's very important. Yep. Yep. Okay, um, and but once everyone is repentant, this is yes. this is the um, thing that Mahanin talks about that we shall find that between the days of the flesh and that reunion, there has been some subtle connection by which every family has again been united. Yes, yes. 
to pass the throne complete in the great review of all peoples, climes and tongues, chanting the one universal anthem of thanksgiving. Yes. Yeah. So this is the beauty of once all of those emotions that cause us a, pers a person to not repent or not forgive, once they're all dealt with, of course there can be harmony. Mm. Uh, after that, there can be harmony in the relationships between people. But unless people are sincerely going to address their issues through repentance and forgiveness, there can be no harmony. There's no way that we can resolve and have peace on earth unless we learn how to repent and forgive. Yes. We need to learn both things yes. in order for the earth peace to come. Yep. And, and if you look at that from a governmental point of view, you can see that everywhere. If you look at it from a family-based point point of view you can see it everywhere whenever anybody doesn't want to enter into repentance or forgiveness and it has to be both for yeah. a relationship to be re-established yeah there has to be both and a relationship is not possible unless both occurs yeah and and this is what we need to understand it's such an important issue for us to understand in our progress towards god mm, it is yeah. and my need earlier in the chapter is really just saying like that's how you know, the um, line from the Lord's Prayer, which says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He's, mm. he's trying to say, this is the only way we bring the kingdom to, come earth. to earth. Yeah, yeah. Um, this, is, this, is, this is it. Yeah. Uh, so it's a pretty important thing yeah. to take note of. Yes, yeah. I find it quite remarkable on earth because everyone who wants to talk about love wants to talk about love, but they never want to talk about repentance and forgiveness yeah. generally. And I find that quite remarkable, given the fact that repentance and forgiveness are, are the demonstration of love, particularly when there's been damaging things in the past that have occurred. And if you're not capable of repenting or forgiving, then it's impossible for you to come to learn about, about love. You yeah. can't do it. It's yeah. impossible. And, and so you can talk about wanting to become the light of the world, as we started the chapter out on, by becoming more loving and demonstrating that love. But if you're unwilling to be repenting or forgiving, then you're not demonstrating any light of the world at all. Mm -hmm. In fact, you're demonstrating the same darkness that exists within the world. Yep. So, so understanding the principles of repentance and forgiveness and actually learning how to go through the process of repenting and forgiving are so important for, your fu for the future development individually, but also important for peace to exist here on earth and in the lower spheres of the spirit world. In fact, the lower spheres of the spirit world won't even need to exist once this occurs. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is the sad thing is that on earth we have this option and yet most people don't take it. They, they, whenever anybody does something damaging to them, they always want to do something damaging back. And whenever anybody, uh, whenever somebody who does the damage does it, they always want to make out they never did it. <laughs> You know, they always want to make out, minimise it, justify it, shift the blame to somebody else. And this is all resistance to repentance and forgiveness. And of course, it never is going to result in peace. It can't. You've got to have a sincere resolution of problems before peace can occur. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So such a place is, he says, do you see, think such a consummation is possible? <laughs> yes, it is. But only if persons, there's a great big if there, yeah, you know? only yeah. if people learn about repentance and forgiveness and go through that process. Yes. Yeah. You know, that's what they're yeah. going to need to do. Yeah. 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 And then he mentioned Satan. And I wondered <laughs> if you would like, if I read that passage. Sure. Uh, yes. And it is the only way by which I can imagine that God can bring all things into subjugation to himself as he has promised. Subjection. To himself, Subjection, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Yep. To himself as he's promised. If only one soul, even Satan himself, shall, be, shall at last be alienated from God, he cannot be all in all, so far as I am able to understand the meaning of the kingdom. Exactly. For where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But yes. to grant such liberty to only one alien soul would be to risk again the ruin of the whole by his influence. Yes. So really, what he's not suggesting there is a Satan. No. What he's doing is he's saying he knows that Fred was, had grown up in a religious environment. Yes. So he knows he's read the Bible and, and the Bible indicates things about Satan. So what he's saying is this whole concept that Christian re religious faith has that Satan is a permanent condition, that Satan will mm -hmm. never repent, mm -hmm. is actually against all of God's laws. Yes. And so either Satan cannot exist or Satan would have to become and repentant. a repentant son of God at some point in the future. Yep. One of those two things has to be true. And yes. that's what he's suggesting in this paragraph. He's suggesting that, that even if Satan himself did exist, he would have to 
eventually become reconciled to God. Yes. Because God's laws all work towards reconciliation with God. And all of them do. A person, in fact, can't, cannot exist without eventually going through this process of reconciliation with mm, God. Mm. And, so, and so sooner or later, God will be all in all. Mm-hmm. And if, if, if that's the case, if sooner or later God is all in all, in other words, God is linked with everyone and everyone is linked with God. If that's the case, then even Satan himself must have been reconciled. <laughs> if Satan existed at all. Now, later on in the second book, we find out that he stares more you know, specifically yes. that Satan doesn't exist at all. But, but he's just using a Bible quote here to teach Fred the inconsistencies of the Bible itself and his own belief systems. Yeah, mm. yeah, exactly. And that, that's a device used a lot of times throughout this Correct. writing, isn't it? Yes. To, use, to draw upon the Christian understandings of the reader yes. to help demonstrate a point. Yes, yep. and it says, and he says correctly here, he says, to lose but one solitary mm. soul, so Satan would be a solitary soul yes. under this circumstance, yep. from the family of mankind would shatter the attribute of God's omnipotent, omnipotence. Yes. Because he could not remain almighty if, while he willed salvation for all, he failed to secure, secure the one that would remain estranged. Yeah. So, so this is the thing, is that all of these concepts that are oh, God's omnipotent and yet and yet saying at the same time that Satan can exist forever are two complete opposites. Yes. And, and it's, a logical, it's a logical presentation that they must be two complete opposites, as yes. he points out. Yes. And that's what I love about a lot of these <laughs> things in these books, is there's such logical presentation of facts that, that any person who's reasoning, not, not, you know, not constrained by family or doctrine or any of those things, but actually re- uh, any reasonable person would go, yes, I can see that must be the case. Yes, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Um, okay, in the next paragraph, he's, he's going on about this, and he says, it's possible for such a consummation, for is it not declared that God will have all men to be saved? Correct. Which is what you're just of saying. course, the argument of many p- religious people is that Satan was never a man. Yes. <laughs> so that, yeah. that gets them out of that, com- <laughs> that conversation. <laughs> And furthermore, that as in Adam all died, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Mm. The two alls are coexistive. Mm. And it is an act of basest injustice to our Father to entertain for but one moment the thought that his scheme of redemption would not be as complete and efficacious. Effic- I know what it means, I can't say it, <laughs> as the necessity of sin demands. Should we say efficient? <laughs> yes. Which basically was what it means. Yeah. As Efficacy. the necessity that of yeah. the sin demands. So he's basically saying, look, on one hand we say, oh, everyone is dying because Adam sinned. Yeah. And then we say, everyone's going to be made alive because of Christ. Yeah. And then we say, well, surely the all in each case would apply the same. Like if everyone died because of Adam's sin, then surely all should also become alive if exactly. because of Christ. And so that's, that's referring, isn't it, to the, um, the idea that Adam and Eve chose well, not the idea, the truth that Adam and Eve chose to not have God and this created a whole lot of um, problems yes. for the whole world, for everyone in the world. Yes. So if that was affected everyone, then be you... Well, no, it's, it's not really me being referred to here when we're talking about Christ the either. Condition, it's the condition, It's the condition of being at one with God. So, so when they refer to me as the first Christ, yes, I was the first person who became at one with God in the first century. I did that. But, but the reality is it's, it's God's love that it's referring to. So in God's love, all shall be made alive. So yes. sooner or later, everyone, we expect everyone will receive God's love. Now, it doesn't mean that there might not be times when God withdraws the option to receive it and then gives the option. And we can discuss that at another time. But... but the reality is sooner or later, given the, an infinite existence, yep. you would expect that every single individual who, who have ever existed would eventually find God. Mm. Yeah. Well, and that's what he's saying. Not at the same time, it? of course. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that depends on their will. Well, and that's the next thing that Fred raises. He yes. says, but are you not neglecting the fact that salvation is very much very much depends upon the willingness of the individual. <laughs> a, con- a condition which is not always attached to the invitation, as we all know, yes. um, that it's 
that just because God's inviting us to um, grow in love and to become more loving doesn't mean that we're necessarily <coughs> saying yes or using our will to, yeah. to engage those laws that yeah, are operating the condition, I think you said which is not, but it is, is always attached to the invitation. Oh, sorry. So, so God's condi- giving us an invitation. which is attached to the invitation. Yeah. yeah. So God's... Gi- so, excuse me, I'm just going to have a cough. <coughs> it's <gonna squat>. <laughs> <laughs> so we turn off my sound. <laughs> You're right. <coughs> That's better. Um, yeah, so uh, so the condition attached to every invitation by God is a, uh, it's up to you. Yes. You can use your will to get this or use your will not to. It's up to you. And, and it, while it's a valid point that everyone has free will, people don't understand the power of God. And they don't understand the power of God's laws. And they don't understand the power of sin. Yeah. Because it, it, the power of sin is that it eventually causes pain. Mm-hmm. And eventually you get into so much pain that you want to change. Mm-hmm. And there's the power of God's laws. Yes. Straight away you get to a point, sooner or later, and there's people that get into extreme pain. Yep. And sooner or later they get into so much pain that they want to change. Yep. And then they decide to change. Then they decide to engage through the use of their will a desire to love. Yep. And so, so God's made the entire universe like that. So that means that sooner or later everyone's going to be drawn into the loving condition, whether that loving condition is a natural love condition yep. or a divine you know, a love condition where everyone is connected with God. That's up to the individual will as well. Mm-hmm. But you would expect that sooner or later, given infinite time, even that's possible, yes. that everyone will actually enjoy God's love out in the at-one-minute condition. But it doesn't mean there might not be ebbs and flows in that process yeah. but sooner or later because of the power of god's laws and the power of the pain that create that we create through sin mm-hmm. that sooner or later we are going to be drawn back to love through some process which is it's kind of exciting isn't it of course <laughs> <laughs> I think it's one of the most exciting things possible because it it means that there's always hope for every single individual. Yes. And it also, so this whole thing where you see on earth now where there's this feeling of hopelessness that everything is going to stay like it is and it's always going to be suffering and pain and and all these kind of things, that that is not physically possible actually from God's law's perspective. Mm -hmm. So while it may take time in order for peace and love to exist on this planet, it will eventually happen because God's laws ensure that it will eventually happen. Yeah. And that's the power of God's laws. And that's also the power of love. Yeah. And, and, it, and just how long it takes will depend completely on our will, collectively mm. and individually. So, so the, the average person on earth resists everything. Yes. So it's going to take a long time if you resist everything. <laughs> Silly people. <Yeah. laughs> Do you understand that? You, you resist everything. Of course, it's going to take a long time. But, but if you embrace it, it can be a short time. Yeah. And, and this is the thing. It's all dependent upon our will. So, so it really does not make any logical sense for us to not embrace. Because all we're doing is we're delaying our own happiness. Yeah. Uh, it's a very silly thing to do in the lo- if you yeah. think about it. Yeah. So what we need to do instead is say, okay, let's stop this resisting process that I'm in. Let's stop this whole concept that I can boss God around and all that kind of stuff. And somehow I can change the universe by opposing God. That's all, all started with a mon and a man, the first human couple. And it's all rubbish. You know, yeah. you can't, it's all been proven, I think, well and truly. Um, so why don't we engage a different way? Why don't we engage a more logical way, actually, mm-hmm. um, towards, towards God and God's laws and God's principles, and particularly towards love. Even if you don't believe in God, you would be better off focusing your development in love, at least, because that will definitely result in happiness in the long term for yeah. not only yourself, but everyone around you. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You say it so good, darling. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's really what Mahanin says it really well as well, where he says, you are thinking of man's free will and opposing that to God's supremacy exactly. as though man is able to stand against him. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And Impossible. And later on, he says, man, by his perversity and rebellion, may hinder and delay He cannot prevent the achievement of salvation. (laughs) Exactly. The ultimate lies in God, who will have all men to be saved, which is another Bible quotation, I think, there. And one of the most damaging emotions I feel that are on earth at the moment is this rebellion, this whole feeling of rebellion towards God and rebellion towards God's laws. You know, 
like it makes no logical sense to rebel against a, a universal creator who created laws that are completely unchangeable. So, you yeah. know, rebelling against those things only is going to result in pain and suffering. Yeah. And it makes, so it makes no logical sense to continue the rebellion. But we still see many people who've come to our sessions continuing rebellion after six years of coming to our sessions. So, so <laughs> I don't, uh, We so see that. I see that in myself. <laughs> um. <laughs> and it, and it, does it, it, it just doesn't make any sense thing. to me. Yeah. yeah, and it's also so self-reliant, isn't it? It, it is. It feels like, no, God, your laws and everything you're bringing me is not the best for me. I'm going to try and stay like the person who truth has to come from and the person who decides what's best for me and well, it's it, so limiting. It demonstrates that we haven't let go of self-reliance. Yeah. yeah. We, yeah. Haven't, we haven't come to trust God, to, to honour that God's got a loving purpose and, and, and loving, the yeah. most loving being in the universe. Yeah. We haven't come to trust any of God's laws really when yeah. we're in that state. And so there's a deep need for us to be a lot more self-reflective about those things yeah. if we believe that, that we somehow can oppose God and, and get away with it. Yeah, in the yeah long absolutely. Run. And when I say get away, I'm not it, talking about it from a punishing perspective. I'm just saying that if we can oppose God and God's laws, you know, there are the natural consequences of breaking a law. It's like falling off the roof, breaking the law of gravity. There is a natural consequence that's going to be painful when you break these laws. And so you can't get away with breaking these laws. The opposite is also true. If you engage these laws, everything will work in harmony and everything will work in order to support you to become more loving. That's how God's created the entire system. So, mm -hmm. so if you're experiencing a lot of pain and suffering, it's the direct result of you resisting yeah. the laws yeah. and resisting this loving God who just wants to teach you how to love. Because it, really when we find the way, our pain can be, the, the suppressed pain that we carry within us, that can be the total amount of pain that we have to deal with yes. ever again. Yes. We just have to work through that. And as we do, life will get better. Yes. We'll feel better. We'll have different attractions as we begin to work through what's already within us. Yes. But a lot of us don't do that. We no. keep choosing to accrue pain. Well, we keep and choosing resistance, don't yeah. we? Yeah. And it's, a, it's such a sad thing that, to keep choosing resistance. And a lot of the times we do it out of fear. That fear becomes the governing... So instead of, instead of thinking, I suppose you could say, instead of having a Pollyanna viewpoint of life, which is a sort of this positive attitude with life, we have this negative attitude with life because of what's happened to us generally. And as a result, we have this fear pervades every way we think, every way we feel, every way we act. And because of this fear, we don't take actions that, that support the belief that there is a good God and there mm. is, that God's laws are all beautiful and loving. And, and we, once we take action in that direction, we have a hope of changing everything, including ourselves. But, but every time we don't take actions in those directions, of course we're going to experience more pain because that's the natural consequence of breaking law. Breaking the law. Yeah. 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 So there's this whole theme of law, isn't there, all yes. the way through the chapter as well? Yes, there yeah. is. There is. Yeah. Okay. So... Um, Fred begins to feel that this is very good news now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think he felt that <laughs> well before this. <laughs> it is but very good news. Yes, he's beginning to express his excitement. His excitement and joy. Yeah. 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 Um, That's the beauty of truth too, isn't it? Just yeah. like you feel the joy of it in your soul when you hear it. And this is what a lot of people who first heard Divine Truth have that joy. Uh, isn't it so <laughs> wonderful to hear that? Isn't it amazing? And of course, it's only when we get into our resistive emotions that we start getting down, that yeah. we start actually, that that joy disappears or dissipates. Yeah. So we need to remember that as well, yes. that our joy is only dissipated. When, when we first heard it, we were joyful and encouraged. So if our joy is now dissipated, it's because we're resisting now. Yep. That's my only reason. <laughs> and you know, um, from my own experience, when when I begin to feel terrible, it's because I'm in resistance. Yeah. And even really highlighting the truth about that resistance can help me to feel better. It's the it, yes. Does that make sense? Yeah, like totally. To, even to knowing even the truth about the resistance. Exactly. <laughs> just makes you feel happier. <laughs> yeah, it, it feels like a relief. Suddenly there's yeah. more connection with truth inside of myself. And so... But it also feels, doesn't it, like... Um, what would you say? If it, it feels... It feels like, oh, I've got an answer of where I need to go from here. Yeah. You know, there's that feeling of a solution is possible. Yeah. You know, in this world that we live in today, 
there's very rarely solutions possible. Um, and that, that's a problem, isn't it? Like you, you don't, and you, so you finish up feeling so hopeless because there's no solution. And it's, this is why there's so much joy when there's a solution to an issue, isn't it? It's just like, yep. it makes you feel, ah, relief of ha actually knowing there's a solution. <laughs> <laughs> it's just wonderful. <laughs> it is, yeah. 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 So um, then towards the end of the page, um, he wants to ask he, another question. He has more <laughs> questions. <laughs> Mahanin says, ask and, and ye shall receive, which is uh, another uh, thing that you've said, which is requi recorded in the Bible. Yes. But it is a really, uh, again, an important thing that we always keep saying about Frederick is that he does, he demonstrates this law in action all through the book, doesn't he? Yes. And that, that God really does operate yes. under those... Um, those principles, yes. but it must be a heartfelt Correct. desire And, and I'd like to talk about that a bit, because yes. a lot of times I hear people asking for three different reasons. Firstly, there's a heartfelt desire for truth. Mm -hmm. And under those circumstances, why wouldn't you want to answer those questions? And that's why I spend many, many hours of every day answering quick questions from people, even though I've answered them before many yeah. times. <laughs> and because I feel the heartfelt desire of the individual to know the answer. And that, that's wonderful because when a person's heart is open to knowing the answer or wanting to know the answer, that creates an opening for you to give them the answer. If a person doesn't really want to know the answer, then no matter what you say to them, they won't hear what you say. Mm -hmm. So that, that's one truth that God created, in fact, about our soul. Every time we have a soul-based desire to know, then we create an opening. It's an opening in our soul now where truth can enter. Yeah. So, so that's one which is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And always we respond to that kind of questioning. Yeah. There's two other types of questioning. One other type of questioning that we see quite frequently is the kind of questioning that you ask the same question over and over again because you want to have a different answer. Mm -hmm. and we see a lot of people doing that, don't yeah. we? Yeah. And those kind of uh, questions, while they might deserve one answer, don't deserve the next <laughs> series of answers <laughs> because they indicate that the person didn't want to hear the answer and they just want to know, they just want an answer they already believe. Mm -hmm. So they're, look, they're looking for it, they're searching for the answer they've already, they already feel they've found yes. in their soul. So their soul is not open to hearing a different answer actually. Yeah. And under those circumstances, we can't really share truth with them. The third type of questioning is the type of questioning that's driven by very dark and evil motivations about criticism and, yep. and innuendo and trying to, you know, to suggest things through the question. Yes. Where, where a person who's truly uh, considerate and loving doesn't make suggestions through questions, they just tell the truth. Yeah. So they say, I think you're whatever, rather than going, uh, wouldn't that mean, blah, 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 yeah. you know, wouldn't that mean that you are like this, yeah. you know? That that's a that's a very sneaky and malicious and manip manipulative and way. And it's untruthful. And it's also it? untruthful yeah. because they they should just say the truth, which is a statement. They're really not make asking a question at all. They're making a statement. Mm -hmm. And this is the third type of question we often come against in our life. And and under those circumstances, when people make statements like that, we tell them to get lost generally. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't generally say it like that. I just yeah. say, look, no, I don't want to answer any of those kind of questions. You're being malicious now and unloving. And, you know, I don't really want to engage with you anymore as a result. Mm -hmm. and, and this is the sad thing is that even on Earth, the way we ask questions has been manipulated in such a way that no, you can't trust that every question being asked is actually driven by a heartfelt desire to know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the times it's not driven by a heartfelt desire to know, it's driven by a heartfelt desire to criticise and attack and abuse. Yeah. And, and this is a sad fact of our life on Earth. People, can, people are so covered over from their true nature, they have so much facade that they can't even make a statement about what they truly feel anymore. They've got to frame it in a question that's actually attacking and abusive and, and full of innuendo and condescension. And, and those kind of questions really can be completely ignored. Yes. And in the spirit world, if the person had the attitude of that kind of questioning, they would never be answered by a celestial spirit as, as Afra is getting answered constantly by Fred.
mm -hmm. uh, by, uh, by my hand, sorry. Yeah. The reason why Afra is constantly getting responded to for his questions is because he has the first attitude. Yes. The attitude is, I want to know more. I love this. It's so wonderful to know the truth. And I want to know what's going on. And even if I'm wrong, I want you to tell <laughs> me. And I want to see where I'm wrong, you know. Yeah. He's got a humble attitude to asking questions. Yeah. And that's so wonderful. Yeah. 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 It is. Yeah. It is. Um, okay. And so... His final question is really about whether you would teach this truth on earth, which is about man's free will mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. everyone coming to, to God eventually, mm -hmm. that everyone will come to God. Mm -hmm. um, would you even say that on earth? And Mahanin says... Of course I would. Of course I would. And then um, the real question, which he should have probably asked. Yes, he does that. <laughs> he does that a bit. And Where then would be the restraining power from sin? In other words, if you tell everybody that sooner or later they are going to be in a condition of love because all of God's laws draw them to that place, yeah. and sooner or later, given an infinite world and an infinite existence, they're going to have to become loving. Yeah. <laughs> and if you tell everybody that on earth, maybe a lot of them will just sin more. Yeah. And this is a very, very religious viewpoint. Right. That you tell people a lot of negative things uh, by, by basically blackmailing them, you tell them a lot of negative things that aren't true mm -hmm. in order to control them from being evil. Yeah. And, and there's this concept that somehow you can control a person from being evil by telling them a whole heap of lies that they finish up believing is truth. It's not a good policy, really. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it it's based <laughs> on fear. And it, has, it doesn't change the hearts of anyone. No, and uh, that's the key point. If, if anything, it just encourages them to live in more and more fear, to um, take notice of what fear is telling them. And then that becomes a huge issue where you are only motivated by the avoidance of fear. By the avoidance and of pain in the end. Uh, fear and pain. Threatened pain. Threatened pain. Yeah. And then someone has to come along and just threaten you with some pain and you'll do that and not even consider exactly. whether it's moral or not. Yeah, yeah. sad. Yeah. Sad what that does. And yet, if you look historically at most of the world's religions, this is what they have done. Mm. They have taught their constituents in a manner that has this carrot and stick. Yeah. You, you supply the carrot because that you know, drives the desire, yeah. but you also supply the stick yeah. because that keeps them in line. Right? Yes. And yeah. there is this concept that, that uh, even in a lot of the holy books, that God does this, that yeah. God supplies a carrot and a stick. Not true. No. There's only a carrot. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> From God's perspective, that's all there needs to be. Mm -hmm. If you either desire to do it or you don't, and if you don't do it, there are the natural consequences of you not doing it. And all of those natural consequences, if you really understood them, you probably wouldn't, you wouldn't engage them. <laughs> In other words, you'd want to follow the carrot because, it, because all the natural consequences of not following the carrot always results in pain mm -hmm. because of the way the laws are constructed. Mm -hmm. And, and, this is, and this is just a natural consequence of dis disobedience to a law. Yeah. And so we need to understand that, that this whole concept of, you know, having to tell, don't tell people things because they might be worse is not, like, don't, that's really saying don't tell people the truth yeah. because they might do the wrong thing afterwards. Yeah. Well, if they do the wrong thing afterwards, that's, isn't that their choice? Isn't that their decision? And that's actually... Um, I feel that's honouring their free will the most. Correct. Because I'm not trying to manipulate what they will do through using fear or un any tactic. I'm saying this is the truth. Yep. God is loving. Um, there are natural consequences. That's also the truth. Yep. But no one's going to come and hunt you down and you know yep. put punishment upon you for all eternity. No. Then that person, we get to see what's in their heart the most, don't we? We do. We, we get, and they get to see that as well. Correct. Whereas when I'm threatening them with a fearful uh, scenario or something that will um, make them feel afraid and they act to avoid that fear, then that, I'm not seeing a true reflection of where their condition in love is at all anyway. No, not at all. Yeah. You give people opportunities and then they reflect their condition of love yeah. of what they really desire. Yeah. Do they really want to use their will to become more loving or not? And what we're seeing I I ourselves in sharing divine truth in the world a lot, and we remember we've been doing this for 2,000 years, so you know, we've had a lot of experience with this, <laughs> and, is, and particularly now, even before we've become one with God again yeah. in this time, we see a lot of people using their will to 
do the opposite of what the love would dictate. Yep. And, and, and then, of course, there is a natural consequence of that if, as further pain in their life. But we don't punish them for taking such actions or anything. It is just the, the consequences of taking those actions that they'll start to feel. Mm -hmm. Now, if they act in such a way towards us, then, of course, we withdraw from them. That's a natural consequence of their action as well. Yep. We withdraw from people who are going to treat us badly and unlovingly. That's a natural consequence of the law. Mm -hmm. In fact, what we're trying to do is demonstrate the law in operation to those, to those people so that they can contemplate, do I really want to love or don't I? Mm -hmm. And in the end, it's all about whether you really want to love. Yeah. That's what all of your progression in the end is about. And by the way, if you're progressing on the natural love path, you're going to have to learn how to love anyway. So there's this, we, you know, we've had many questions this week that we've answered in the emotions FAQs, yes. where we talked about, do you really want to love? Mm -hmm. Like, do, do, do you really want to? Because it, cause it seems to us that maybe you don't. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. you know, maybe you don't really want to love. And, and that is the real issue. We are going to have to grow in love, whether we grow on the path to natural love, perfect at natural love, or we become at one with God. We're going to have to learn how to love. And that's going to mean giving up all of our false concepts about love and also imbibing, you know, receiving a whole heap of new concepts about love. And you can't receive new concepts about love without telling someone the truth about them. Yes. And this is what, what Mahi knows yeah. fully and Fred is just learning. Because basically what Mahi is suggesting is how can, you, how can you not tell people the truth? Yes. Because it's the truth that is going to encourage love. It's the doorway to love. Yes. So it's, going, it's the truth that's going to encourage love. Yeah. So, so if you withhold the truth from people, how are you helping anything? No. You're helping them to become more unloving and more afraid. Yes. And that's not love. Yeah. So that's going to only cause damage. Exactly. Yeah. And he says, um, I'll just summarise everything you said in what he said at mm -hmm. the start of that page. Such a gospel would change that entirely referring to the, this is in response to the, the gospel question. of love, let's the call it. The gospel of love, yeah. yeah. <laughs> now men are taught to come to God from fear of the torments of hell. But I do not think that that is God's ideal way. I don't think it's any of God's <laughs> No, I don't think he's really <laughs> yeah. positing it as any kind of way. But anyway. Don't we have an FAQ next week coming up where, where somebody asks that question? She says to us, oh, isn't it good that I fear God? Because that's the reason why I was interested in divine truth in the first place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think we have a good answer for that. Yeah. <laughs> if I understand him right, he would have them drawn by the story of his love mm. rather than driven to him by the lash of terror. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and then he goes on to point out um, something really valid, and that is, isn't it better just to say the truth? And even if you think back to sharing of Marie's story in The Harvest of Jealousy, mm -hmm. wasn't that incentive enough for people? That's the natural consequence of when Of a life that's engaged out of harmony with love. Yeah, so mm -hmm. wouldn't that be incentive enough to to consider your actions while mm. on earth. Yep. And I agree that this giving people the full idea, the truthful um, viewpoint of what happens when we pass is actually, yeah. well, for a start, it appeals to the logic of far more people. It's of very course. hard for people to relate to that right, right up until the point, the moment of death, that's when I've got the opportunities and after that they're all gone. Yeah. And, and like in um, the poetess said in her, in the chapter before, she felt a little bit uncomfortable about how um, some of the deathbed confessions were, you know, securing people a place in heaven. In heaven. Whereas <laughs> other people who'd been like really holy and ethical all their lives were yeah. going to the same place. Yeah. So I think it appeals to people more in terms of their logic of course. that there is a continuation of these opportunities. Yeah. But also just showing uh, like these hellfire kind of images that people have been given through lots of different, actually lots of spiritual paths mm. kind of preach this terrible mm -hmm. fate. Um, it, it only has the, the effect of causing people to fear mm. and not to grow in love from this sincere place of aspiring to a future that holds unconditional love mm. And, mm. and not this sense of judgment and punishment. Mm. 
Yeah. yeah. I, th I feel too, like we often get criticised, don't we, for all sorts of things sometimes. Uh, and it's interesting reading some of our emails because we get criticised from all ends of the spectrum. So there's some people say we do this too much and the other people say we don't do that enough yeah. and so forth. And there's just this wide variety of criticism that comes. But so three primary criticisms that come about these issues are this. They criticise us firstly for saying that talking about love and th that you don't need to be focused on doctrine. Right? Mm -hmm. They criticise us when we talk about the hells. Yeah. Because nobody wants to hear about the hells. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody wants to make out that if there are, is it, there is a life after death, then we want it all to be good. Yeah. <laughs> right? We don't want to. We don't. And and if there's bad people, well, it's not me that goes there. Yeah. And when we talk about some of the attitudes that cause us to, to go there a lot of people are very surprised because it means that they'd probably go there yes and then they get very you know triggered or upset. very upset about that and then as a result they get quite angry with that suggestion and then there's the uh, third group of people who basically don't want to hear any truth at all about the afterlife isn't there like yes. the, the, who don't even believe in one yes and never want to hear about it yeah. and and it's unfortunate in every case because the truth would set them free in every case yeah and this is what I find sad about not telling the truth. You know, the fact is that there's been so many lies perpetrated on the earth by all religions yep. in different ways. Some truths, but heaps of lies mixed in with these truths. And the, and the sad result is that nobody really knows what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so there, the, there is a, often ranging from complete disbelief right the way through to maybe it might happen but there's never any firm idea or concept about what will happen yeah. because nobody has ever been told the truth yeah. and yet there is so much truth available there's all those people who have passed who have ever passed all know a part of that truth they mm -hmm. do mm -hmm. all those even the people in the hells know that they they are there because they chose to be unloving while they're on earth right they know they made that choice and and while they might not have come to a full recollection and also then repentance, they do know that something went wrong. And if they had known what went wrong before they arrived, how easier would it be for them to reverse their decisions? Mm -hmm. It would be much, much easier. Mm -hmm. and, and so I find, and, but also the gospel of love was also not taught. It's all, there's all this threat, 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 threat. And, and the whole concept that, oh, if you do God's will, you'll pass into the right hand of God or some, you know, and that's where you'll play your harps and everything mm -hmm. else. With this whole concept of what is life after death if you're a good person, most people would look out on the earth and go, oh, I don't want to have that life, you know, like yeah. who wants to sit around <laughs> doing that all day, you know, and all week and all month and all year for yeah. the rest of my life. Yeah. And, and so because there is not a truthful account of what actually happens when you are in harmony with love, yes. there's also no desire developed within the individual to become a loving individual. So we have, we have all of these negative consequences from the truth not being presented on earth. So, and this gets us back to the start of the chapter, I feel. Yes. Let the truth shine. Yes. Let it shine. Don't hide it. Because when you hide it, you're contributing to all of these lies that have occurred through history that, that ha are currently contributing to all of our pain. Mm -hmm. and, and, and if you do have some truth in your heart and you do know it to be true through your own experience, share it with the world. Don't, don't be backward and coming forward. But share it with the world. Don't be afraid, right? Because at the end of the day, this is truth that people need to know if they're ever going to have a, have a happier life. Yeah. 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 So I, I just feel the way, if you look at how he's rounding it out here at the end saying, yes, the need, there is a deep need for us to tell the truth yeah. at all times. Yeah. And how that relates to letting your light shine. Even yeah. there, is a, there is a great big relationship between those two states. Yes. Yes. You know, it's only the truth that leads us to light. Yes. Yes. And what he says there at the end, that about when we come into contact with love, that that is the most um, powerful thing to help us repent anyway. Yes. And to help us feel how distant we've become from love. Yes. That, that how powerful is that rather than having um, a stern 
grandfatherly headmastery type telling you off for all the things you've done. Yeah. To come into contact with someone who loves you and wants to help you through the natural consequences of what you've done, yeah. how how far more powerful would that, Is that be? be? Yeah. And I like the probably second to last statement he makes in the chapter where he says, imagine what the regret of a soul will be brought into close contact with Christ and God, feeling to overflowing the intensity of the love the wherewith. wherewith he hath loved us. Yes. And yet to know that it, it has sinned against and grieved such love. So again, it's sort of like once you start realising how much you've opposed love in your life, there is a fair deal of grief to feel about that. Yeah. Uh, about the the way in which you've opposed love in your life and, and even the way in which we're currently opposing love in our life. There's a, we need to understand the relationship between the pain that we're currently in and how much we oppose love in our life because there is a direct relationship between those two things. So, so I feel this chapter has been very good on a number of levels to help people understand more about love, mm -hmm. what, what love is like, mm -hmm. but also more about like, the importance of sharing the truth and, des and developing a desire to love yep. and to look sincerely at all of the resistance that we have to love. Yep. Yeah. And also this thing that you talked about, about midway through our chapter, about the fact that it's inevitable that we're all going to, all the laws are designed to bring us towards love. Mm -hmm. And it's only a matter of time and our resistance is what's creating the most pain. Yes. And so we can give up that resistance, give up resisting love and life will change really quickly. Yes, yeah. yes. And I think we also need to understand resistance in that process, <laughs> yep. which, which obviously we've been trying to do with people by, by sh talking to them about how the soul functions, because it's not an intellectual resistance, it's driven by emotions that we need to come to understand and let go of in order to actually progress. Yeah, and certainly I find this chapter really challenging in terms of my own resistance. Yeah. I feel it talks about um, themes of family and soulmate yeah. and that this wonderf these wonderful loving laws that are in operation mm -hmm. upon us here and in the spirit life. And I suppose that I feel through my family experience, I feel quite cheated of... I feel that my experience set me up in opposition to a lot of those laws. Mm -hmm. What I was what I was taught to believe about truth and emotion and love mm. were all very much in error from God's perspective. Mm. And it's a process of years mm. working through all of my fears mm. associated with letting those beliefs go. Mm. And um, as you know, in our relationship, and I spoke about it in general terms when we were speaking in the soulmate section, but, you know, a lot of what I, the way I was taught to regard myself um, and my sensitivity and my passion and my desire for love and change and things like that. All of the good things about your soul. <laughs> I don't view them as good things about my soul. I feel ashamed about them and yeah, I feel... Sad, isn't um, it? I feel embarrassed by them mm. and I feel awkward about them. Mm. And so a lot of that has come, sadly, from my the way I was brought up, which came from the way my parents were brought up, mm. which came from the way their parents were brought up. You know, mm. it's, a, mm. it's a long family l chain mm. of s um, very entrenched beliefs about emotion, about and passion. And also very entrenched concepts of love that are completely false obviously because yes. they because yes. they're causing so much pain so they must be false yes yeah. and the denial of self being um the way to show love mm. that's a really primary one that i don't think is unique to my family no, it's, no. it's f pretty um entrenched kind of in entrenched society. and even associated with you know being with you in the first century and all of this sacrifice equals love and all mm. of those kind of things end up being really damaging to mm. the way a child grows up understanding what love is and mm. what love does and what it looks like and what it feels like mm. and all of those things. And mm. I often find it very confronting reading this material because I feel like I'm so far removed from 
myself and yeah. from you yeah. and from from a life that I do remember that mm. was governed by different different things. But my just because I remember yeah. them doesn't mean that my resistance to letting go of the grief I have associated with that changes. changes. And so that this is where we're, the will has to be engaged, isn't it? Yes. To, to actually, and this is like the will to repent and the will to forgive. Yep. The, you know, the, which is one of the main points of this chapter really, yep. has to be engaged if we ever want to experience change yep. and ever want to get back the happiness even. Yep. And, and this is the, the sad thing I see is so many people resisting one or both of those things. Absolutely. Forgiveness and repentance yep. are both being resisted. And, and it, because they're both being resisted, of course, no real happiness can result. And so I feel there's so many really good principles in this chapter, mm. as you said. Mm. Mm. And, and I feel like a lot of us who um, have been around divine truth teachings and talked about some of those very things that I just mentioned about families and things, there's still not within us this desire to even face the resistance we have towards forgiveness, yeah. towards the knowledge that forgiveness means I'm going to deal with that pain. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to feel it for what it is what it is in me now because mm. you know even I'm not even around my family now and I'm still I'm still carrying this stuff of beliefs painful yeah. fears all these things yeah. and if I'm going to forgive I'm going to own that for myself and feel that for myself yeah. and there won't be blame and there won't be a desire to punish and there won't be a desire for someone to share in my pain or but there someone also to acknowledge won't be the my pandering pain. there used to be before and there won't be the support of their unloving behavior anymore or any of those things either yeah yeah it'll be yeah. A, a beautiful loving response yeah. to the treatment that's been received yeah a truthful response that upholds the worth of me and them correct. simultaneously correct and uh, yeah. yeah, I'm pretty bad at that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I feel like for everyone, it's all, we all need to understand we're works in progress, but we also need to be sincere. And, 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 you know, as you know, like developing a will to forgive is a pretty difficult thing to do because mm -hmm. my, for most people, they have a will to punish, a will to attack, a will to... Or a will to self-punish. Or a will to self-punish. Rather even, than feel... But even underneath that usually is the underlying will to punish the other. Yep. And, and, you know, and when it comes to things where we've damaged other people, very rarely, for, it's very rare on this planet for people to actually exercise repentance. Yes. Particularly complete repentance, where they actually work through not only the fact that they did such a thing, but also the reasons why they did mm. such a thing. And uh, these kind of things need to be worked through, really. And if we consider that, what you just said, that repentance, it's, it's very rare for someone to repent. And yet most of us set Desire up inside it. of ourselves uh, the situation where we feel we're not going to forgive until we receive repentance Correct. from the person. Correct. So we, we're binding ourselves up into this impossible situation. It's yep. rarer for someone to repent than to forgive Correct. while still on earth. Correct. And if we are basing our willingness to forgive on the other person repenting, we're, it's, we're bound up now for, yeah. for decades, centuries yeah. maybe even. Yeah, and we're going to arrive in the spirit world not in the place that this young fellow that we've been discussing yeah. Will, yeah. will arrive, yeah. but rather in a much darker condition. And then we're going to probably have a good yell and scream at God about that. But the reality is we've only got ourselves yes. to blame for not engaging the process of repentance and forgiveness. Yeah. So, you know, at the end of the day, we need to allow ourselves to see what's really going on there. And this is why the truth of all of these things is so important. Yeah, and mm. that's something... Um, to remember as we read the book, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And something that um, you've reminded me of is, is to let the truths within the chapter have their impact upon us. Mm -hmm. um, to, to let them touch the errors that are still there and let exactly. us use that to have our response and yes. begin to understand what our resistances are and what our fears are and what our grief is. Yes. Yeah. And I feel, I feel probably that's something we could say in conclusion is that many, we know many of you have been following the, the books as, we have, as you've been reading through them. But we can see that many have also just been reading through them. Yes. There, yeah. there is very little desire to fully 
and analyze what's really going on in each of these chapters and and what we'd like to encourage people to do is to if they have done that is to go back to the beginning and start reading the chapters letting their heart be touched by what's being said yeah and, and let themselves be let themselves feel about what's being presented because each each paragraph actually is pregnant with principles of truth yes when i say pregnant i mean it <laughs> like that pregnant because it's not yet going to give birth to principles <laughs> of truth unless we let it touch our soul yes and and this is what we need to do when we're reading these kind of books we need to let the material touch our soul we need to act upon the material we need to see it for what it, for for what it is showing us the way in order that we're going to need to live if we're ever going to experience happiness. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just a one, it's wonderful, uh, as we've talked about, it's a wonderful book, but it, yeah. is, it is an especially good chapter for that. Definitely. For, for self-reflection. Yeah. It is, mm. it is. So we encourage you in that process mm. and we'll see you again for chapter 19. And hopefully if you enjoyed the discussion of chapter 18, <laughs> this, this chapter. <laughs> Thanks for your time. <laughs>